I remember exactly where I was inside my mechanics hangar. Pat Brown, an ambassador for AOPA, had sent me the cell number for the vice president. I had some questions for Pat and he said I should call the VP. On his cell? Yes. Wow, okay. I called Richard McSpadden for the first time. Hi, I'm Dan Milliken and this one is going to be tough. I'm not going to tell you how many takes I've already done. I'm just going to try to get through this. I'm going to talk about a friend, a mentor, and show some of my favorite moments of video he did with us on this channel. This is my way of dealing with the huge gut punch that we received Sunday evening, October 1st, 2023. The gut punch was the news that AOPA Senior Vice President of the Air Safety Institute had died in a plane crash in Lake Placid, New York. He was flying right seat in a Cessna 177, a Cardinal, with retractable gear. There was some kind of an emergency and they turned back to try to make the field, uh, but they crashed so short of the runway. And I don't know if Richard was the pilot flying or if former Super Bowl champ Russ Francis, who was the left seat, was the one flying. Russ had recently bought an air operation out there. We don't know what the nature of the emergency was at this time. Believe me, I want to know. I want to know bad. I was friends with Richard, but I can only imagine what close friends and family are going through right now. But just being honest with you, I'm having a real tough time with this one. I talked to a psychologist friend of mine yesterday. Why, when there's a plane crash, do us pilots want to know what happened so bad? And he said it was very normal. As pilots, we identify with this shared risk. He used the analogy of a mean dog in the yard, and we've got to get through the yard. And when one of us goes through and gets bit by the dog, we want to know which side of the yard did he walk? Did he tease the dog? Was there something about his actions that brought the dog close and made the dog aggressive. We don't want the dog to bite us. For now, speculating why the dog bit our friend doesn't really help. I want to know the truth, but that's gonna take a real investigation. But I wanna know, bad. And I'll wait for the professionals to find out why the dog bit my friend. This is bad on so many levels, and certainly one level is how incredible of a pilot Richard was. If the best of the best of us can crash and die, what hope is there for me? And the only answer I can come up with for that question that keeps rolling around in my head is that on each and every flight, I have to treat it seriously and with the respect that the flight deserves. Each flight could end up with a death. What am I going to do about it? At the top, I started the story of my first ever conversation with Richard. It was the first of many. He answered my AOPA questions with an instant friendliness I wasn't expecting. It was like talking to a good friend, a, a buddy, and he had that way about him. He talked with um, a maturity, a perspective that was right on. This was someone who I would call to get advice on different things. I knew he was just a phone call or email or text away, like the last time we talked last week. There's a new aviation TV thing about to happen, and I wanted his advice, so I called, and he answered. And he said he was just that he just boarded a commercial flight, but he took the time to talk to me before they closed the doors, and that was Richard. A few hours later, I had an email introduction to someone that could help me, and that was also Richard. As a truly good man, he was well-connected with a myriad of people that liked and respected him. So he was all the time serving as a, a bridge, a conduit to bring us all together. And some of the guests on our show in the hangar came about because Richard sent an email of introduction. He helped me connect with the head of the NTSB. We were unable to make the schedules work, but I can reach out to a new friend because of Richard, and who knows, maybe we will have him on the show soon. 
Richard agreed to fly all the way out to Fort Worth from the Washington, D.C. area with Mark Baker in tow to be on an episode of In the Hangar during COVID. And that was the first time I met Richard face to face. And I didn't even find out until later after we had taped and I posted the show that he had actually been a fighter pilot and flew number one for the Thunderbirds. He never mentioned it. So I asked him to come back and talk about that. And he did. And he also did some pilot stories for us. But more than all that stuff that you guys didn't see were the phone calls, the chats, the advice, the friendship. And I'm going to play for you some of those moments on camera that we captured now. So your dad was a huge influence. Big influence, okay. yeah. Okay, yeah, that's kind of cool. Huge influence on me, yeah. And so he, uh, I got my inspiration from him, and then so did my brother. My brother is a 747 uh, captain for mm -hmm. UPS. And then he taught his son to fly, and I taught my son to fly. He taught his daughter to fly, and I taught my daughter to fly. So it's like generations now. And my mom's the one that started this all. She yeah. gave my oh, dad gave the gift this of, gift. Yeah. Of a and then flight. it's now three generations and going. So That's we're pretty cool. yeah, we're a pretty big aviation family. And it was a fantastic job because you're flying the lead airplane, so you're flying one of the best fighter airplanes ever built. Um, and you're all dressed up in red, white, and blue. Your airplane's red, white, it was very pa patriotic in my family and how we grew up. And so to, to just wear that and sort of immerse yourself in this patriotism was just fantastic feeling for me. And so as we do that uh, 9G pullout and we're pulling in, we, we roll and sit and it looks like we're in undetected. And now we think it all worked. We're just happy, you know, our fangs are through the floorboard. We're ready to attack. And we go to pull. And in that pull, it's loud. I'm pulling to the beeper on the F-15. It has a beeper that tells you how close you are to the maximum G. So it's about nine Gs right at it. And um, beep, 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 beep's going off loud. There's a lot of wind noise. And I hear my wingman calling, knock it off. My wingman is off to the side of me as we pull in. And I can't believe he's calling, knock it off, because we're in. What do you mean, knock it off? We're in. We made it. We're pulling. And he calls, knock it off again. And so finally, I echo the call, knock it off, and he said he could just see my eyes, you know, he's a couple thousand feet away just beaming through and through our mass, and I'm like, you know, thinking to myself, why in the world would you call knock it off there? And uh, he says, you're missing three feet of your right wing. And I look out over, and there was about three feet of the right wing tip in the F-15 that had snapped off, and it was gone. The, the world has good karma, I think, so one of my earliest memories is um, walking on Tyndall Air Force Base flight line in Panama City, Florida on my dad's shoulders and we were going to see the Thunderbirds perform. Oh, cool. I think they were in F-4s at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I just have a very, very vivid memory of where that was and seeing that. So when I got the call that I had been selected for the Thunderbirds, I was an operations officer on Tyndall Air Force Base. And so I oh, walked back, wow. uh, I'll, I'll get choked up talking about it. I walked back to that same spot and called my dad. Oh and said, my gosh. Um, you know, Dad, you know, I'm Thunderbird One, and that that's, was really a meaningful moment for us. Oh my goodness, yeah. that's amazing. What's it like between Thunderbird pilots and Blue Angel pilots? You know, we we have a lot of fun, as you might imagine. Uh, and I got to tell you, I'm really, really proud of those guys because they have fought and scratched and clawed their way to be the second best jet demo team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. You know, the scariest moment for me is an easy one because in my year and. 2003 in September, Mountain Home Air Force Base. You may have seen this picture. There's a picture of a guy in an F-16 that's ejecting out, and he ejected within, I think it was uh, eight tenths of a second of the airplane hitting. There's also a video of him ejecting out of the cockpit. Well, that was my team. And so um, we, I was in the diamond formation. We had made a diamond takeoff, and the way it worked is if this is the runway, the diamond takes off, and it comes down, and it's going to come in perpendicular to the runway. And then he takes off and does a split S. And your whole work there is my job is to deconflict from him, let him give enough time to do the split S before I come over. Well, by the time I turn the corner, all I see is just a line of fire, and I hear people yelling, knock it off, Thunderbird 6 has gone in. And there's... If you're an air show pilot, you hate line, line of fire like that because it usually means the pilot tried to stay with it and didn't get out. The smoking hole is, you don't, you don't want to see any of them, but you'd rather see the smoking hole than the line of fire. 
And so that was, that was one of the worst moments, probably the worst moment of my life. I knew him well. Uh, I mean, I loved him and his family, and I thought the first thing I thought of was his family and his children. Um, and then within maybe 30 seconds, I had the best moment of life when they said, Thunderbird 6 is standing up and waving at the crowd. Oh, oh man. Oh, good. Goodbye, Richard. You left us way too early. I wish I could call you right now to get some advice on how to handle this situation where a friend has died in a small plane crash. Because I know your words would give comfort. And part of me just never wants to fly again. If it could happen to my friend, the extraordinary pilot, it could happen to me. But I know what you'd tell me. You'd tell me, by all means, be safe, but to fly. Keep flying. So goodbye, Richard. Fly heading 270, cleared, direct destination, which as a fellow Christian is not a sad thing. But the hole we have in here is a huge punch in the gut, and I'll leave it with a quote. When a pilot perishes in an aircraft accident, suddenly in an instant they're gone. They blast a hole in the lives of spouses, children, grandchildren, and close friends that can never be filled by anyone else. The mourners learn to cope with the loss, but they never get over it. Our lives are just one of the many influenced by the decisions we make in the cockpit, even when we fly solo. Those were your words, Richard. Blue skies.